My name is Bill Lee Forth, and I'm here in my shelter in place uh, my sports den, which you can probably see on the walls in the, behind me. The intent today is to not just review my book, but to take a look at what led me to writing the book and the people involved with the book and how their lives were affected with baseball. Let me give you a little background about myself. I'm Chicago born and raised. I was raised on the south side of Chicago on 35th Street. So if there's any White Sox fans uh, viewing this, you'll probably understand what that means. I was able to walk to White Sox games as early as the 1950s. First couple years, my brother took me because I was only six or seven, but by the time I was eight, I was able to uh, walk to Sox Park on my own. Um, Looking into the background as I started to look into this, the National League of Major League Baseball was created in 1876. That means it took them 71 years before they integrated baseball. Now, why did I write this book? What led me to write this book? In simple terms, I can tell you in two words. And those two words are mini minoso. Now again, if you're a Southside Chicagoan, a White Sox fan, uh, or just a baseball fan in general, you probably know who Minnie Minoso was. He was my favorite ball player as a little kid. We used to sit in the first row of Comiskey Park and he played left field. This did not start out to be a book. This actually started out because in 2006, there was a decision made by Major League Baseball in conjunction with the Hall of Fame, I think I said 06, I meant 05, to look into the Negro League players, who a lot of them were great ball players, but never really got a chance to play in the major leagues either at all or only for a very short time. The initial list that they created had 94 players on it, and that included Minoso. A second ballot in, I believe it was uh, November of 05, uh, reduced it down to 39 and Minoso was still included. The final ballot in early 2006 elected 17 players and owners and managers, but excluded Minoso and excluded uh, Buck O'Neill, who actually was sitting in Cooperstown because they expected him to get elected. And I was still working at this time. And just casually, I would start looking this up. Who were these people that they picked? Who was Willard Brown? Who was an owner, Alfie Manley? Who was Alex Pompez? Well, as far as I could find, he was a chief of the number runners in Harlem. Who was Frank Grant and Mule Stutters? So I started doing a lot of research on this. And as I did this more research, my wife came one day and said, you know, maybe you should write a book. Well, English wasn't my best subject in grammar school or high school. Uh, I love doing research. I love finding facts and figures in that. Uh, and like I said, originally, I didn't intend to write a book, but my wife suggested it. By then I had about 12 inches of um, paper on my desk. And so, the first thing I looked at, well, who were the first players? In 1947, there were 16 teams. And of course, everyone knows that Jackie Robinson broke the initial color line. But if you could see this and you start to look at that, you'll see some players down towards the bottom. John Kennedy with the Phillies, he played in five games before they released him. Hank Thompson and Willard Brown both had 21 and 27 at bats with the St. Louis Browns. And they were both released, although one of them did become a Hall of Famer. So these, and if you count them real quick as I'm talking, you'll see there's more than 16 because actually for two teams, the Reds and New York Giants actually had two black players play on the same day. But you'll also notice that 47, there was a few players, three actually. But then in 48, there were none. Then a few more. 52, there were none. So some of the teams are not really actually 
uh, trying to integrate. This story is about those men, not just those 18 that were the first players to initiate, but in many cases I drilled down, I found the second, the third, the fourth, and even in some cases the fifth black player on the teams, just to get an idea, did they just bring one player up real quick, um, just to satisfy the media or whomever, or did they actually care to integrate the major leagues? I looked at how they performed. I looked at how were they treated. Even as late as 1959, 12 years after Jackie Robinson integrated in 47, and three years after Jackie retired, Pumpsy Green, the first player on the Boston Red Sox, still felt prejudiced against. He felt that the fans, the ownership, and other people still, even that late, were still prejudiced. They came from all over the place. They came from Negro Leagues. A lot of them came, uh, there used to be uh, company ball teams. They came from Puerto Rico. They came from Panama, Cuba. Some are still living. I actually, when I wrote the book, I sent a copy to the second black player on the Cardinals, Bill Greeson, and he wrote back, sent me an autograph card. At the time my book was published in July of 19, I think there was six living, but four of them have died since then. But all of them, all of these players were heroes. In addition, I also cover some of the scouts, John Donaldson, Buck O'Neill, who were two of the first black scouts in Major League Baseball, and then the writers, writers like Wendell Smith, if you've seen any of the Jackie Robinson movies or read any books about him, Wendell was the writer that lived with him and stayed with him, and even some of the white writers, if you will, because back in the 40s, and actually they started champion for black players in the late 30s and early 40s, was the communist newspapers. There was a gentleman named Bill Nardo and Lester Rodney, and they were constantly uh, writing stories, say, why is baseball, amongst many other things, not uh, integrating? What were some of the roadblocks to these black players? Well, almost every black player that was from the USA served in the US military. So in the prime of their life, they lost several years. Willie Mays played one year, was rookie of the year in 51, and then got drafted and served in Korea for two years. And of course, a lot of them entered very late in their life into Major League Baseball. Loss of salary. Believe it or not, Roy Campanella is one example where he was making $600 playing in the Negro Leagues. He was beloved, and he took a pay cut down to 185 hours a month just so that he could play Major League Baseball. And there's other examples of people uh, the same. 86% of the black players in my book were over 25 years old when they started playing ball. 27 to 30 is usually considered the peak for Major League Baseball. It's obviously some play in their 40s, but 40% of those players were over 30 years old. But yet they came, they performed, and then Satchel Page, of course, was the oldest. Satchel was 40 when he played in his rookie seasons. Teams created quotas unwritten. I found many instances where coaches and managers admitted that more than three blacks on a team was not going to happen. And think of it for a moment, how much stress these black players felt because they're in a must succeed when they went forward to play Major League Baseball. Again, I think everyone knows 1947 on April 15th, Jackie Robinson started first base for the Dodgers and was the first player to integrate Major League Baseball. Jackie had the task, he, he was the first player in the National League to remain nonviolent, nonviolent and not get into arguments, not in any way uh, listen to or let people know that they were getting them to the racist comments. What I'd like you to do right now, just for a minute or so, close your eyes. If you're a baseball fan, Pastor Emily, are your eyes really closed? If you're a baseball fan, 
then pick a player that you like. If you can pick a black player, that would be nice. But if you're not a real big baseball fan, picture yourself a minister, a pastor, a musician, a teacher, any profession, and picture that you've played hard or studied hard or trained hard, and you finally get a chance to perform. Now, if you're a black player, Larry Doby, who was the first black player in the American League, when he walked in to the dressing room with his 25 teammates, 15 of them turned their backs and wouldn't even shake his hand or talk to him. Three of them spit on the floor at him as he looked at them and wouldn't shake their hand. And these were his teammates. His first game, and again, imagine yourself walking into your environment, your friendly environment, and half the people there don't like you and are very verbal about it. And then he walked out to play on the field where the first day he played, there was 43,000 people. Jackie Robinson was the same way. At your home field, but again, half those people didn't like you. And then when you traveled and went on the road, most of the other ball players didn't like you. There's that uh, story about the Philadelphia manager who just stood and called Jackie the N-word constantly and constantly. The fans wrote hate letters. They wrote, if you play, you're going to die. Just imagine in your job, if you face this kind of racism or this kind of prejudice, just because you weren't the same as the majority of the people. You can open your eyes now. So there was 14 million black Americans at that time when Jackie played. And Jackie played only nine years, but he did end up in the Hall of Fame, had fantastic numbers. But not all these ball players were Jackie Robinsons. Few of them were anywhere near Willie Mays, who's considered to be one of the best five star players ever in the marriage. A lot of them were just normal players, but they still came wanting to play and they didn't give up. They went out there, they lived with all that prejudice, all that racism, all those threats, and they never gave up. And Jackie Robinson and those black players who followed him risked their lives, not figuratively, but literally, to play a game that they loved. Baseball in America, after that, would never be the same. How good were these baseball heroes that I show in my book? Seven of them ended up in the Hall of Fame. Nine of them were most valuable players. Three of them were rookies of the year. And just to put a personal note in, if Minnie Minoso hadn't been robbed of rookie of the year in 51, that number would be four. All-star appearances, over 90. World Series, 28. World champions nine times from 1947 to 1959 in the National League, nine of the MVPs and nine of the Rookie of the Years were black players. The American League, which was much slower than the National League to integrate, their first MVP wasn't until 1963, and that was Elson Howard of the New York Yankees. And the Rookie of the Year was until 1964, and that was Tony Oliva from the uh, Minnesota Twins. 22% of all the black players from 47 to 59 made at least one all-star appearance. I tried to equate that to the white players, and I never did come up with a figure, but the best figure I could come up with was about 8%. Now, why did the owners integrate? There was a lot of pressure from fans, politicians, the media, and as I mentioned earlier, some of the strongest pressure came from the communist newspaper, which again, communist was not a bad word back in the 30s, 40s, and early 50s. Some owners actually believed, great book if you ever get a chance to read it, is Bill Veck. Uh, he believed it was the right thing to do. Matter of fact, Rumors state, and he said it in his book, that if he had been able to buy the Philadelphia Phillies in the 50s, he was going to put an all-black team together and put them out in the field. The Phillies ended up being sold for half of what Bill Veck offered for them. There were some legal concerns. New York State and New York City was starting to investigate baseball. The federal level, they had changed some laws, and again, 
discrimination, prejudice was not going to be allowed. The most important reason, the very last one, economics, money. The teams were seeing that as the black players came into the major leagues, revenues increased. Now, some teams were still totally against that. New York Yankees and the Washington Senators rented their ballpark out to the Negro Leagues, and they made over $100,000 a year. They did not want to integrate, okay? I also took a look in, to see if there was a correlation between the black population and the teams that integrated. And what I found out was Boston's population was 2.4% black. They were the last team in the major leagues to integrate. Washington Senators, whose population was 23.5, were also one of the later teams. So there was not necessarily a correlation between black population. Although the teams in Boston, excuse me, Cleveland, Chicago, and those teams that integrated were running around a 10 to 12% black population. So that said money to baseball. I also took a look at the attendance. And although the Dodgers and Giants were drawing around a million fans a year, the Yankees were drawing two million. Not because they had black players, but because between 46 and 64, they were out of the World Series only two years. So the Yankees and Dodgers, who were two of the first teams in the game, saw and did see a tremendous increase. Both of those teams before they moved to California saw near 2 million fans a year as they started bringing black players in. Chicago White Sox in 51 brought up Minnie Minoso, Bobby Boyd, Sam Harrison Sr., and a few others, went over a million and outdrew the Cubs for the next eight or nine years. What did I learn <clears throat> while I was doing my investigation, my research, and even writing a book? First, I learned, and I think everybody watching this probably knows, the Internet's not always correct. So what somebody had told me once, if you find a fact and you're not sure of it, find three resources. And if you can't find three resources outside of the Internet, then it may not be true. Don't state it. So I tried in almost all cases, and you'll see a couple examples in a minute, to find three resources when I needed to. Many players didn't believe that Jackie was the best choice to be the first black player. There were players like Josh Gibson, Satchel Paige, and many others. But what Branch Rickey said is, I want a player for the future, not a player whose past was great. Gibson, Paige, and players like that were in their late 30s. Even one of them was in their 40s. So... He did pick Jackie and he did turn out right. Larry Doby wasn't Bill Veck's first choice. He wanted Ray Dandridge, who was playing in the Mexican League, had played in the Negro League, had a lifetime average of around 340. But when he brought Ray Dandridge, Ray said, why do I want to come and play here? You can't afford me. I make $70,000 a year. And I remember this is the 50s. I'm beloved by all the Mexican fans. I'm not coming. He did end up in the Hall of Fame, as he well deserved. The first black player, which was in 1886, Moses Fleetwood Walker, he was a catcher. He had no gloves, no equipment. Now, the catcher in them days did stand a few feet back, but would you stand there and try to catch an 80-mile-an-hour or 90-mile-an-hour fastball with no gloves, being the catcher? Black Latinos faced racism, not only from the blacks, but from the whites. There was a good interview with Ozzie Virgil, who was the first player on Detroit, and he ran into not quite as strong of prejudice, but still prejudice amongst the blacks that he played with. Carlos Bernier, first Pittsburgh black player, question mark. If you go back to that slide where I showed the first black player, I did not show Carlos Bernier. Major League Baseball, most of the uh, statistical organizations have decided that Kurt Roberts 
in 54 was the first black player. Carlos Bernier was a black Cuban. He played in the Negro Leagues. He played in the Canada uh, Black League, but baseball says he was not the first player. I do include him in the second list, and I did look into him in further. Ernie Banks. Everyone probably knows Ernie Banks as the great shortstop on the Cubs, Hall of Famer, one of the top 100 all-time ball player. Wasn't the Cubs' original choice to be their shortstop. Gene Baker, who had, at that point, six years in the uh, Negro Leagues and in the California Leagues, uh, was a shortstop. Both him and Banks were called up at the same time. As you probably know, the white players, or excuse me, black players were not allowed to stay at the same hotels with the white players eating the same restaurant. So every black player needed a black roommate. So Ernie Banks was brought up to kind of be Gene Baker's roommate and sidekick. As it turned out, the day that they wanted to play both of them, Baker was injured and Ernie Banks went and played shortstop and the rest is history. They both hit the same in 54. They both hit about 274. They had about the same number of RBIs and hits. <coughs> Excuse me. And Banks obviously did become. Minnie Minoso did not hit a home run his first time at bat. I probably found a dozen different places that said he did. Well, he didn't. He did hit a home run in his first at bat with the White Sox, but he had about 37 at bats with the Cleveland Indians where he did hit a home run, but not in his first time at bat. Branch Rickey. Was Branch Rickey a genius? Was he like, lucky or was he a psychic? In my mind, he was a little bit of all three. He was a genius because he is given credit for creating what today is called the farm system and starting players down at a class A level and letting them grow up until they reach the major leagues. He chose Jackie Robinson, like I said earlier. He said he wanted um, someone for the future. And Jackie's worst sport in college was baseball. Actually, in his first season in college baseball, he only had 297. What uh, Branch Rickey saw about him, I'm not sure. I read three different books about Branch. I went to all kinds of research places. But I think in Jackie's case, he was both psychic and a genius. But there was two other players. Yogi Berra <coughs> came to a tryout when um, Brent Rickey was with the Cardinals. He came along with Joe Gargiola. Both were catchers. Both tried out. Branch and his scouts told Yogi, nah, you're a little bit sh short. You don't seem to have it. Uh, we don't care to sign you. And they signed Joe Gargiola. Obviously, I'm sure everyone knows that Yogi Berra went on to be a uh, eight-time world champion, two-time MVP, and a Hall of Fame member. And then in 54, when he was with the Dodgers, he drafted Roberto Clemente. Now, can you imagine if Roberto Clemente had been one of the Dodgers outfields along with the other players the Dodgers had? But no. Actually, in 1954, Roberto played for the Montreal in the Canadian League. And in what's called the Rule 5 draft, and I've read a lot of things and I won't attempt to explain it, but they let him go. And the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, drafted him. And, of course, the rest is history. But that last sentence, when they finally called me and said, we accept your book. It's going to be published. It's, it's a wow moment. It's really up there with getting married, having kids, but I would place it third. But it was a fantastic moment in my life. So what's my hope for this book? My hope is that these heroes, these pioneers will somehow be reckoned. Uh, I'll share with you later some of the steps I've taken to try to see if that might happen. Uh, but I think too much and too often, and I went to a lot of my baseball fans, 
friends and said, hey, what do you think of Sam Jethro? And they go, who? What do you think of Willard Brown? Who? And my niece, who helped uh, read one of the original drafts and not a great baseball fan, but she asked me, she said, who's your favorite black player today, not on your home team? I, a baseball nut, had to stop and think who that might be. And I would challenge a lot of you people that are listening to this um, to ask yourself the same question. One idea, and it's not mine originally, I wish I remember where I found it. I went back and tried to find it again. But every April, Major League Baseball honors Jackie Robinson, and every player wears number 42, and that's fantastic. But sadly, the same respect is not shown for these other pioneers and heroes. So my thought is I would love to see a new kind of April 15th. Each year when Jackie's honored, we would also honor the first and where there was a tie where two players played for the team on the same day, two players. And they would not wear Jackie's number. They would wear the first black player on their respective team of the 16 original teams. Cleveland, that would be number 14 for Dobie. White Sox, obviously, that would be number nine for Minoso. And Cincinnati, because they had two, they would shortstop would wear 21 for Nino Escalera, and their third baseman would wear 10 for Chuck Harmon. <coughs> so far, that idea is probably more of a thought in my head. So I asked myself, are there other ideas besides honoring them? I actually wrote to Ken Burns, who is a documentary uh, guru and who wrote the baseball. I actually got a letter back from him and they said, it's a great idea and they'd love to consider it, but he at the moment is working on 18 other projects. I also would like to see all of those first and several of them are, uh, be in the Hall of Fame. I actually was sitting home one day and my phone rang after I'd set some letters out in my book. And I answered the phone and the gentleman said, hi, Bill, this is Tim Reed, Tim Mead from the Hall of Fame. It turned out he's the president of the Hall of Fame. We had a very nice conversation, said he was enjoying my book, but he had nothing to do. But uh, I would like to see at least the original teams every year and some do it on the 30th anniversary and the 40th and the 50th, but I'd really like to see them honor. And at some of the other places I've gone, I've uh, asked, are there any ideas? So if you people have any ideas, go ahead and um, email me, or if you see me at church, tell me about it. And what are my concerns regarding black players in Major League Baseball in the future? One, there's not a huge feeder system anymore. There is Jackie Robinson baseball and Little League baseball, but they're not as um, involved. There's not that many people. Travel baseball is very expensive, not only for inner city youth, but for anybody. Baseball is not considered exciting. In 1980, almost 19% 19 of the players were black. In 2018, less than 9%, and that equaled about 63 players out of the 750 players on the rosters were black. In 2018, out of 449 pitchers, only 14 were black. In 2018, 11 teams had less than two black players, and two teams, sadly, had zero players. And that was the Padres, and the Diamondbacks. And one dad kept track of um, what it cost him for his son from five to 18, and he came up with $78,000. This is a quote I took from uh, the first inning of Ken Burns Baseball. I will just read the last. Most of all, baseball is about time and timelessness speed and grace, failure and loss, and perishable hope and coming home. I would like to thank you, whoever does view this, for allowing me to present my book, 
below are various ways that you could reach me both via email. I'd also like to give a, a special thanks shout out to Diane Janeko, who gave a fantastic review in the uh, Our Savior's newsletter. And I wish I could meet her in person or find out her email address so that um, I could thank her. And here comes the advertisement. The book is available. At the moment, I'm giving my proceeds for all sales um, to Feeding America. Um, I don't know if that will be $10 or $100, but I am donating all of that. The book is available in many, many places. If you have any questions, feel free to post something on Facebook, email me. And with that, I again say thank you very much.